Hello everyone, my name is Richard Maud and I'm the director of the 2020 ANU Crawford Leadership Forum and it's my great pleasure to introduce this webcast. This is the third in a series of public discussions by the Australian National University on some of the biggest global questions raised by the pandemic. Through this series of events, we're seeking to sketch the contours of a changing world and ask what the pandemic might mean for Australia and our place in the world. Today, our focus is on Asia. Before going any further though, I wanted to acknowledge that today I'm joining you from Canberra on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And our Australian audience join us from many different parts of the country. So today we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands each of us meet. I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be watching today. Asia's rise in recent decades has changed the world and shifted relative economic, geopolitical, and even cultural power towards this fast changing region. Now, Asian governments and societies are grappling with the immense change and damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So how will Asia recover? Can we still talk about the possibilities of an Asian century? How will the pandemic affect the geopolitical competition for power and influence that's been rising in Asia? And has Asian regionalism played any significant role in coordinating responses to the pandemic? I'm really delighted that we have today four foreign policy specialists from Asia to discuss these questions. And I'm equally delighted that the university's own Evelyn Go, Shedden Professor of Strategic Policy Studies, is able to chair our discussion. Evelyn specialises in East Asian strategy and security. As today's discussion is being broadcast live, I encourage you to submit questions to our panel throughout the discussion using the Q&A function in your toolbar. Now, one last word before I hand over to Evelyn to introduce our speakers. I just wanted to say that I'm really delighted that we've got four foreign policy specialists from Asia joining us today, and equally delighted that um, the university's own Evelyn Go, Shedden Professor of Strategic Policy Studies, is able to chair our discussion and Evelyn specialises in East Asian strategy and security. So now I'm going to hand over to Evelyn to introduce our speakers and get us underway. Evelyn, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. And welcome everybody to the latest in this big picture series on Asia and COVID-19. Asia, of course, is a huge and diverse region and the challenges, responses and impacts of the pandemic vary greatly across this region. COVID-19 has spurred intense debate and further complicated politics within and between countries in this region. To help us to understand some key trends and to analyze the region's prospects and possibilities, uh, we have four eminent experts from Asia today. Let me introduce them to you briefly in turn. First up, we have Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar, who is Research Professor at the Center for Political Studies of the Indonesian Institute of Sciences and Vice Chairman of the Habibi Center. Ibu Dewi has also served in government. In 2010 to 2015, she was Deputy Secretary for Political Affairs to Vice President Bodiono under President Yudiono. And in 2015 to 2017, she was Deputy Secretary for government policy support to Vice President M. Yusuf Kala under President Jokowi. Welcome, Dewi. Next up, we have Professor Suk Jong Yi from the Graduate School of Governance at Song Kyung Kwan University in South Korea. Professor Yi is former president of the East Asia Institute um, and has directed the Asian Democracy Research Network since 2015. It's good to have you with us, Suk Jung. Next up, we have Professor Huang Renwei, who is the Executive Director 
Executive Director General of the Institute for Belt and Road and Gov Global Governance at Fudan University in Shanghai, as well as an academic committee member of the Center for International Strategy and Security at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Thank you for joining us, Renwei. Finally, we, last but not least, we have Dr. Dhruva Jaishanka, um, who is joining us from Washington, DC. Um, he is director of the US Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi and a non-resident fellow with the Lowy Institute. Dr. Jai Shankar was previously a fellow with Brookings India, the German Marshall Fund, and the Rajaratnam School in Singapore. Welcome, Dhruva. Now let's get started um, on what is a rather full agenda. Um, we'd like to divide this initial discussion with the panel panelists into two segments. Um, in part one, we'd like to address some big picture questions for the region as a whole first. Um, so I'd like to begin um, with two or three general questions, which I'll invite the panelists um, to weigh in on um, as they see fit. First up then, in your view, what are the top two impacts that you see COVID-19 as having had on the Asian landscape as a whole. Um, Dewi, would you, would, you, would you like to, to start us off on this, please? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for bringing me to this discussion uh, through webinar. Um, the, as, as you know, prior to the, to the uh, pandemic uh, crisis, uh, we are talking very much about regional integration, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the focus was very much on intensifying regional cooperation in all pillars, political security, economics, uh, social, cultural, within ASEAN, you know, we are, we are well in the, uh, in the progress of developing an ASEAN community and within the wider uh, region, uh, in connectivity is very much the buzzword and that also focuses on people to people, the focus on uh, trade exchanges, tourism, people exchanges, and so on. And this pandemic clearly has hit uh, uh, at the, you know, the nerve center of all that interaction because we have total disruptions of trade, tourism, people-to-people -people exchanges, and, and, and so on. Now, the, the, the two top impacts, there are so many impacts, the two top impacts is that, you know, each, we are forced to uh, carry out physical distancing. We have closed our borders, so there's a real hardening of the borders. Uh, People coming from other countries uh, for tourists and, and for meetings, you know, uh, are, are no longer uh, allowed to come. So we have returned to this very hard borders uh, situation. And, and each country uh, has had to draw very much on their own national resources uh, to, to be both, both to contain the pandemics and also uh, to deal with the social economic impacts. So then we have seen, you know, the very harsh economic fallout of this uh, economic growth in some countries have gone to minus uh, and uh, there are large numbers of people who are going into poverty so each country will have to grapple with the social economic uh, impact at the same time you know when instead of uh, going full force at integration regional integration you know we are being again you know have we, we have people are very worried now you know how much complex inter interdependence uh, can can be safe in the long term because when you have pandemic like this you have to be able uh, to deal with your own health crisis on your own, provide your PPE, provide your medical supplies, uh, and then also make sure that your people are fed. You know, you have sufficient food supply uh, internally. So there'll be, uh, there'll be questions later on, you know, to what extent we need to develop national capacity and not to rely too much on international trade. So this is, this is going to have an impact. And, and, but at the same time, while we have disruptions on, on this physical connectivity, uh, we have this acceleration of the digital uh, economy and, 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 you know, this uh, webinar and so on. So uh, the process of doing business in Asia uh, will, be, will probably be different. We need to refocus later on, you know, in, uh, in prioritizing in areas in, uh, which could enhance uh, integration, which could uh, ensure, uh, you know, ordinary life uh, that we can live it as normally as possible by using uh, technology. And, and uh, you know, and, and dealing with this crisis. So in the long-term impacts, I think, you know, how to, to, to uh, deploy new technologies to mitigate the, the uh, negative impacts of this crisis uh, will be the top priorities. And uh, I would argue that 
global health issues, uh, pandemic issues, uh, will become a much higher pri priority uh, for all of us, including in Asia. Thank you. Thanks, Dewi. Um, could I invite any other of the panelists to, to, to weigh in as you? Well, I think we have to think about the global impact of COVID-19. And there has been a kind of backlash to globalizations before the arrival, arrival of this pandemic. I think the pandemic has speed up this, uh, it's not totally reversal, but the weakening globalizations in trade and investment ties and so forth. Uh, I guess uh, many industries and economic sector are trying to, to adjust the global supply chain. In the past, the global supply chain was based on the economic logic of uh, saving the money, such so, you know, looking for cheap labor costs and that kind of things. But now many countries are trying to, to diversify all this global network in order to make sure the, the supply chain <clears throat> will be very secure. And they have the concern about also public safety issues when they are engaged in economy activities. So therefore, I think uh, the pandemic uh, is, is pushing for uh, kind of uh, um, reshoring or onshoring. So we we'll see, you know, the, the, whether it can help the regionalization of uh, Asian countries, because in Asia is, is uh, we are pretty much, you know, dependent on the Western market as well. So we'll see whether this, the alignment, the alignment of a productive and investment mechanism are actually facilitating the deepening regionalization uh, that will be very important issues. And Asia in particular will be influenced by the US-China competition. Um, and here already the competition of this G2 uh, has been great before the arrival of this pandemic. Uh, we remember all last year and, and, and until the, uh, the beginning of this year, the keen competition spreading from trade and then technology like a, uh, AI technology competition as a force. And this pandemic seems like to speed up the strategic competition between two countries. Uh, who knows the direction? Because uh, we didn't know, the, you know what kind of, who's going to lose, who's going to win in this strategic competition. And pandemic has accelerated, but we don't know, you know, the who will uh, lead in this uh, competition. And I think this competition is very important in the future of Asia because if we look back at the post-war economic prosperity and peace in Asia-Pacific region, uh, we based on the U.S.-led hub and spoke alliance system, um, you know, helping the national security of many countries in the region. And then since the 1990s with the rise of China, our economies in the region are very much aligned and tied up to China. So therefore, if Asia century continues to the future, we still need uh, the strong Chinese economy that will benefit the other countries in the region. And at the same time, we need a continuous US presence in the region, that's very important. Uh, and, and if these two conditions are not met uh, properly, uh, will be uh, in difficult times. And uh, I think it's very important for Asian countries uh, to provide and to strengthen the multilateral, uh, many economic institutions and security institutions as a hedge. Both Dewi and, and Suk Chong have already set the scene with, with a you know, quick sketch of some of the key um, problems and opportunities as well that, that um, the region faces. Um, the two sides of the short-term connectivity cuts, right, that we face as a result of COVID, um, the longer-term potential uh, backlash and, and harm to the kind of globalization, um, globalization-based economic models that those of us in Asia have not just grown dependent upon, but have grown rich on. Um, and developed on, on the basis of. But Dewi has also emphasized the opportunities that come with new tools and opportunities of the digital age that, that, that we have. Um, and of course, the, the thorny problem of great power competition 
um, in the region and uncertainty which has been there already prior to the onset of this pandemic, which is being exacerbated by it. This leads me to the following question, the second large pic uh, big picture question of, you know, will, will these impacts really cause Asia to become fundamentally different, right, um, than, than what we were seeing prior to the onset of the pandemic? Suk Jong mentioned the Asian century, for example. Can we still think of an Asian century, given the scale um, and depth of these challenges? Perhaps I could invite the other two panelists to share some thoughts on, on this question. No, I, I would agree with the previous two speakers, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, framing what the challenge is. But, you know, we, we are living in a period of great uncertainty right now and trying to make sense of that uncertainty is, is, is sort of what we're all tasked with doing. Um, obviously, you know, I think the, the first layer of analysis, the first way of thinking about this is, is the public health dimensions of it. And different countries are obviously dealing with in different ways and are, and are, are suffering in, in, to different degrees from, uh, from uh, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you have countries that have recovered quite quickly, uh, you know, uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, uh, mainland China, Hong Kong have done quite well um, amongst others, South Korea, of course. Uh, but others where India, where I'm from, uh, where it seems to be peaking now and, and we have uh, about 12,000 new cases every day. Uh, being reported. So I think, you know, that, that's the first sort of level of analysis. The second, of course, is the economic impact, not just of the coronavirus pandemic itself, but also the countermeasures the various governments are taking uh, to address it. And I think, you know, we can break this down to a number of ways. One is the globalization itself, that is trade, travel, uh, foreign direct investment, and how that has been frozen. Second is consumption patterns and how that has changed. Um, uh, the third is uh, investment and how that's, you know, uh, particularly at this time, while we will have some investors who are taking advantage of the situation, it'll also lead to a lot of risk averseness. Um, a fourth factor, I think, is manufacturing, uh, which will, as a result of uh, a constrained investment, of, of a, a drop in consumption, and, and of uh, global, a disruption to globalization, manufacturing in certain sectors will suffer. And finally, I think energy uh, factors, and particularly energy and resources, uh, something of particular importance to Australia. Uh, we'll, we'll see now some very, uh, some changing patterns of, of uh, energy consumption as well. Uh, now, what does this mean geopolitically? Uh, you know, I, this, in some ways, this, this all spells a, a great intensification of, of competition, and not just at the national level or between states, uh, but also in, within states, we're finding as well. So states and municipal governments are now competing with, with, with each other uh, for scarce resources in a way that wasn't, uh, we thought we were over a little while ago. And so what does this mean for the Asian century? I mean, obviously there'll be some countries that will be uh, worse affected, some will be better, some will recover more quickly. We saw with the 2008 financial crisis how um, many Asian economies, in fact, uh, rebounded much better than a lot of European economies. Um, and so, you know, I think each major economy, if you look at the, its profile, will have certain vulnerabilities. China will be particularly susceptible to drops in investment and, 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 and exports, uh, whereas other uh, countries will, you know, uh, energy exporters will be, uh, will be disrupted in different ways. So, I, I, you know, I think while it's too early to say this will have an impact for the region as a whole, there will be immense variation in terms of how coronavirus affects uh, different countries in the region. May I say something? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to participate in this uh, conversation and the dialogue. And the question is, uh, how Asia future will be? Uh, I'm more optimistic, seeing based on the reasons below. Firstly, Asia up till now is the best region control the pandemic situation. This is the region firstly outbreak the pandemic, but in only two months, we control the situation. And now Asia, mostly East Asia, is the least cases of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this pandemic and the, the least number of deaths. And European more than 4 million cases, uh, are, are close to uh, more than 3 million cases, and the US more than 2 million cases. And in Asia, I think about East Asia, 
about uh, 100,000 cases. And the many Asian countries, the death number is only lower than 100. Some Asian countries, even they have only zero, like Mongolia, Cambodia, Vietnam. So this is almost marvelous uh, comparing with other regions in the world. So we can see the culture, the institution, the governance. You see, during this crisis of pandemic, Asia is the best. And the second, our economy is recovering from the uh, recession. Uh, I think uh, now we can see US and the European, Western European, or, or the whole European is falling into very serious economic recession. How long will it be? I believe more than two years, the recession of uh, European and the US economy. But in Asia, we can see a positive growth rate will be this year, 2020. Uh, maybe the, the growth rate is much lower than last year or before. In China, maybe two growth, uh, percentage uh, growth rate, but comparing with negative growth rate, about five to eight in Europe and the US, two percent growth rate is still high. It's too high. And uh, uh, the, like our friends uh, in Korea, uh, from Korea said, uh, the uh, supply chain is changing fundamentally from global wide to regional wide. So the, uh, the supply chain will be shortened. Uh, like East Asia will be, become some kind of block of uh, supply chain. And we have Japan, South Korea as the top level, China in the middle, uh, Southeast Asia, Asia in the middle and the lower. So this is a whole system of supply chain. And uh, I believe this will be more sufficient and more efficient uh, and more sustainable. And about, how about China and the US? Uh, I put the ideological and the, uh, political factors aside. If we just talk about the pandemic, we China, we, I tell the truth, we sincerely want to cooperate with the US in this pandemic control. We should cooperate with each other. We should do all the coordinate work together and, uh, and to exchange information, uh, in, uh, exchange the technology uh, on this control pandemic and uh, distribution the materials necessary and also uh, work together with uh, WHO. We send many messages and the proposal this kind of cooperation with US, but they are all refused, rejected by White House. So it's a great pity we lose, or we are losing this chance, this opportunity to have two powers cooperating, working with each other. But we still have time. If US wants to work together with China in pandemic, pandemic control, we still will be very eager to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huang. Right. Thank you, Renway. Um, now, I, let me, perhaps I can move this conversation on um, to the second part of um, where we'd like to go, which is a slightly more in-depth look at the particular countries and the particular sub-regions we have uh, represented here by our, our various experts um, who, who have a better sense of the fine grain detail uh, in these um, particular areas. Um, but before we get there, of course, a reminder um, so far from Druva about the variation that we, we see across this very large region, which we, we now can think about in a bit more detail. Also a reminder from Runway about you know, the comparative perspective, what Asia looks like when we compare it with other parts of the world, and some reasons perhaps to be optimistic here about the prospects um, economically, particularly as, as we go forward. Um, 
And, and finally, again, the reminder about great power politics, um, whether it's about the pandemic as a whole, by itself or more broadly. So these are themes that we will come back to. I'd like to, to, to spend a bit of time with each of the speakers in turn. Now, again, coming back, circling back to Dewey and looking at Australia's closest um, neighboring region of Southeast Asia again. Um, Dewey, if, if, I, if I may, um, let's think about Southeast Asia in, in a bit more detail. Obviously, again, a very, very diverse subregion in itself. Um, what would you say some of the major differences in COVID-19 impacts and experiences have been so far across Southeast Asia? Evelyn, as, as you say, Southeast Asia is very diverse and Southeast Asia is very diverse. Uh, Indonesia is one with the largest uh, number of sufferers and also the largest number of deaths. Uh, also the Philippines and, and Thailand, while, while, while in, some, in some of the smaller countries, you know, there have been zero deaths. Uh, in terms of the uh, effectiveness of uh, responses, uh, Singapore and Vietnam, you know, they've, they've, they've been cited as being very, very effective. Uh, there are, I, I must say that Indonesia, is, there's a mixed record here, uh, that um, some delay, but, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, there's been uh, improved state capacity uh, in, in dealing with this crisis. On the whole, uh, one death is too many, but in comparative perspectives, given you know, like Indonesia has 260 million people, although we have the the, the testing is still too low, in, uh, you know, it's not sufficient yet. Uh, so we don't really know, you know, how many people out there. Uh, at the moment, we have about you know about some 30,000. But when if you look at the deaths, recorded deaths uh, of confirmed uh, COVID, uh, uh, you know, uh, death have been about 2,000. But people say, you know, there are many people who are suspects, but the results have not really been out yet. So it could probably go up to more, some three and a half times of 3,000, uh, of 2,000. So maybe about, you know, get the large scale uh, population, uh, uh, maybe it's still comparatively lower than if you go to the, uh, you compare it to the US or, or Italy. Um, so variations, you know, uh, some countries are much more effective uh, than, than others. Uh, we'll say that while ASEAN has a lot of good intention at the practical level, uh, each country really has to rely more on its own national resources uh, because, because of the enforced control of the borders, you know, disruption of, of uh, uh, traffics and trans uh, uh, trade and, and so on. So um, each country really has to look internally and here, uh, the, the, the national capacity is very important, you know, the, the, the ability of the state uh, to respond to crisis. And maybe one of the good things about uh, Southeast Asian region is that we are very prone to crisis. Indonesia itself, you know, has from tsunami to earthquakes, and then, you know, we have the financial crisis and so on. Uh, there are improved capacity uh, to deal with that. Um, ASEAN has, uh, and ASEAN plus three have come together, the, the leaders have met, you know, they, they want to, uh, to deal with a, a better, uh, you know, a, a deal with a crisis better in the future, though in, in real terms now, uh, each country is still very much reliant uh, on its own uh, resources. Now, we, um, uh, do you want me to ask? Do you want to ask? If I might yeah. pick up the point about ASEAN, which you've already brought up, the Association, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, what has been interesting for many observers in the region is, you know, ASEAN's um, relative lack of high profile um, coordinating role in dealing with the pandemic in Southeast Asia so far, which is a little bit surprising, I suppose, for, for some observers, given that ASEAN does have some formal mechanisms for cooperation, for health security, information exchange, and so on. Um, do you foresee that as, as this crisis pans out, that ASEAN may be able to contribute more towards Southeast Asian management of COVID-19? Well, the ambition is that, as you know, ASEAN already have the AHA Center, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the center that dealt with uh, more uh, humanitarian and disaster risk management. The problem is, of course, you know, in the past, crisis was localized. You have a tsunami in Indonesia or you have an earth, uh, uh, you have the uh, typhoon in, in uh, Myanmar and so on. So uh, countries that are not affected have been able to, to give more assistance. But now countries are affected. 
Uh, and ASEAN, as you know, is relying, relying very much on physical interaction, on meetings and so on. And now uh, you cannot, you know, you can only go through Zoom and, 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 and so on. So they are able to communicate at the virtual level, but at the real, you know, the physical level, uh, there are restrictions. So that means that, and, and countries that should be in a better position, for example, to send uh, assistance, you know, that they've also been very much forced to, to focus on, on their own. But, uh, but this is a lesson learned. Uh, uh, the ASEAN countries and the ASEAN pathway countries now are talking about better risk management, both at the public health level as well as a social uh, economy uh, impacts. And, and I think that's one thing uh, from ASEAN, you know, from each, the, from each crisis, uh, the, the, the regional organizations and the, and, the, uh, and the partnership and the partners have tended to, to have, uh, you know, better meta mechanisms in place. You know, they're, they're willing to invest more money uh, and also, you know, uh, uh, create the mechanisms necessary to do that. You also mentioned, Dewi, that, you know, unfortunately, um, many Southeast Asian uh, countries like Indonesia, I, I, you know, ha are used to having to deal with crises, uh, natural disasters, and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing that is interesting about Southeast Asia, of course, is that, you know, there has traditionally been a fairly strong statist emphasis. Um, the state is, is a big player in, in, in many of the countries. Uh, in Southeast Asia. Do you see the management of the COVID crisis so far um, reinforcing that very state-centric um, tendency in, in Southeast Asia? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the good thing is that when we are talking about crisis, when you're talking about public health, it should be public. It should not be private. You know, it should be uh, made easily available and affordable and, and you know, with equal uh, uh, the equality of access of everybody, and that could only be provided uh, by 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 the state, you know, not by private institutions, and uh, and also in terms of the social economic impacts when people have lost their jobs, when you suddenly have large pool of new poor who have not been in the rosters of those who have received government hands out, you know, so it's only the government uh, that can do that, and uh, and in Indonesia, you know, we have a lot of trial and error here. There have been some. Uh, uh, good examples but there have also been you know uh, some poor examples of uh, correct data and so on so the importance of the state is very important here but at the same time uh, we cannot simply rely on the state it's also uh, and and this is one of the good things also then so it has to be a whole of government and whole of society approach uh, in indonesia the 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 government has uh, been the, the the pandemic crisis in fact has shown both the good the bad and the ugly you know, in, in, in the system, uh, uh, we have seen the, both the strengths and the weaknesses. From the Indonesian case, typical late response, you know, that denial and, and, and going off in a completely different direction. As you know, in the beginning, when, uh, when people were already talking about the, the pandemic, uh, our Minister of Health said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we are a tropical country. You know, we are not going to be affected. The good thing is that because we have so many crises in the past, there's already a, a system in place. Into, since the tsunami, Indonesia has this uh, national a agency for uh, disaster management. And after chaotic communications and uh, incoherent policies by the central government, then the central government uh, appo uh, appointed a task force chaired by this uh, 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 national agency for disaster uh, management and and each region you know uh, uh, also has its own uh, chapter so responses have been much more uh, coordinated and with indonesia we, uh, we have a decentralization system and this is both a headache and a, and a good thing you know uh, one of the bad things about decentralization is sometimes you know the policies are uh, incoherent and lack of coordination. But at the same time, uh, when central government is a bit slow, some of the regional governments are much more up to speed. So, you know, and, and they've been the one. Uh, you have seen the emergence of uh, very effective regional leaders with good communication and who have been able uh, to put, uh, you know, uh, both the public health uh, side and also the social uh, economy impact uh, together. So, uh, as I said, you know, Indonesia is a very uh, complex mix. Uh, uh, we have problems of enforcement and we have problems, you know, civil society has been great. There's been great generosity, uh, outpouring of uh, philanthropic uh, activities. Uh, uh, the, our medical practitioners, you know, health cares, they've been wonderful and they've been wonderful support for them. At the same time, you've also seen signs of uh, intolerance where nurses have not been allowed to return to their 
to their rooms because the neighbors uh, were worried about, about being affected by COVID. Uh, we have seen, you know, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, denial of uh, COVID victim who died. Uh, the, uh, the neighborhood would not allow them to be buried in that area. But at the same time, we, you know, so there's this fear, paranoia, but at the same time, you still see uh, markets congested with people. Uh, when, when malls and, and supermarkets have been closed down, uh, you see people, uh, you know, the uh, informal sectors defying uh, this. Uh, when, when governments have restricted travel, you know, you see large scale of people to going to their villages uh, during Ramadan. So uh, it's a bit, a bit chaotic, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, the state does, does function. And here I might mention about the military because the role of the military has been under scrutiny, uh, particularly under Jokowi's, you know, the, there's been uh, increased incursion of the military that have been brought into the cabinet and uh, uh, been involved in uh, a lot of military operations other than war, including on terrorism. And the current chair of the, uh, uh, the, uh, of the agency for, you know, disaster uh, management, uh, is an active military general, and, and he had to, then the president has to ask for special dispensation because that position is not supposed to be held by uh, an active uh, uh, military uh, officer. And now he's the chair of this task force. But he's been wonderful. You know, when, when you see different government ministers talking about different things and uh, not getting their act together, uh, the fact that this task force is being held by someone who is firm and decisive and, and, you know, and tried to get everybody uh, on, on the same page has been very welcome. And also uh, the role of the military and uh, the military transports from bringing uh, our citizen from, from China uh, and bring, uh, all these, uh, setting up emergency things, for example, uh, their, their role has been very well welcome uh, here. So uh, if there are two things here, uh, regional uh, governments have been doing quite well the role of the military here has been largely uh, positive and the role of civil society uh, has been very, very positive. Thank you, Dewi. Thank you. Um, that, that's very helpful and actually allows us to move across in a comparative perspective to, to Suk Chong um, uh, on, the, on the Korea case. Um, Korea, of course, South Korea, of course, you know, is considered one of the success stories in, in dealing with uh, the, containing the pandemic so far, um, and, and has some rather different, I think, um, factors um, that offers lessons for others in, in comparison with what uh, Dewi was saying, you know, has been um, positive about the Indonesian uh, experience so far. So, Sutong, do, do you think for a start that, you know, uh, the, South Korea should also engage in, in pandemic diplomacy and, and, you know, sharing some of these lessons with, with the rest of the region? Hi, Evelyn. Yes, uh, South Korea has been asked to share our um, the epidemic model, and we call K model, which is based on um, aggressive testing and then contact tracing based on all this IT technology, and then um, successful social distancing with the active participation from okay. civil society. So our model has been praised internationally as a democratic model without a lockup. And uh, 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 so there has been a very much demand to share our model. So in that aspect, I think it's our first time to use our domestic uh, health crisis model for public diplomacy. And our foreign ministry uh, has been quite active in translating our the governance model to the public diplomacy. For example, um, our foreign minister uh, uh, has been active in making announcement through the MICTA network. In the MICTA is uh, Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, Australia, and South Korea middle power networks created by the initiative of South Korea. And the uh, uh, South Korean government is chairing this network and they made a special uh, statement about the, the COVID-19 uh, corporations. And then also the using the United Nations global uh, arena as a stage, um, the foreign ministry has uh, organized group of, group of friends of solidarity uh, for global health uh, security. 
So uh, that's been also quite active part, but I should say that uh, um, it is more like uh, the global network rather than the, the sub-regional Northeast Asian network. Uh, for example, the European countries are talking about the bubbles, right? So with the similar uh, impact of COVID-19, they are going to open up gradually. So logically, uh, considering the low infection rate uh, with the low death rate, China and Korea and Japan could have created a bubble quickly, but not until this moment. And of course, between China and South Korea, we have a rapid corridor panel, so the businessmen can travel uh, without much hassle. But uh, unfortunately, with the uh, uh, quite negative bilateral relations with Japan, we haven't created the kind of uh, uh, the fast corridor. I think it's very important for us, uh, at least China, Korea, and Japan work together you know, to ease the kind of travel bans. And also we have to work together to consolidate this, uh, the health, uh, uh, health uh, issues, uh, sharing information and also working closely with the vaccines and whatever. And that part is still lacking. Mm. That's interesting, Suto, and this picks up on what you said, uh, you talked about earlier about economically, the prospects of actually looking for opportunities to shorten those supply chains in a COVID world within the Northeast Asian context. And what uh, Renway talked about earlier also about, you know, the possibilities of doing that within the broader East Asian context, including Southeast Asia as well. Um, and I note actually that uh, to bring the two, both of you uh, together into this conversation, I note that Runway published um, an article in, in, in last, uh, in March, I think, making the argument that the pandemic should really have a positive effect in the end um, of bringing together the three main Northeast Asian uh, countries, China, Japan, and Korea, um, in a period of cooperation economically and with with um, health and travel as well. I wonder if, if, if both of you might offer an opinion of how likely you think this would be. Can, can COVID-19 actually spur the kind of Northeast Asian cooperation that has been so elusive for such a long time? Okay, <laughs> if I may. Um, yeah, um, actually we talked a lot, um, the, our foreign ministries and also Japanese foreign ministries have thought about, you know, this opportunity, using this opportunity of COVID-19, they can just uh, engage uh, more um, uh, kind of uh, reversing our vicious cycle of diplomatic relations into the positive one and then include China. However, um, during this quarantine period as well, you know, the, the, with the, uh, the stop of uh, the free visa entry of Koreans to Japan, South Korea also banned uh, the free entry visa from J Japan as well. It became a less broker. So it's a pity. I think we need a great political leadership to, mm -hmm. to change this atmosphere. Um, still, these three big Northeast Asian countries are looking only the domestic side, uh, just concentrating our resources to uh, combat this uh, pandemic. And then they are very much concerned with the domestic politics, how you know, this, uh, the political support will be linked to the, the successful management of COVID-19. So uh, I think I haven't seen a great leadership uh, from three countries to pushing and using this opportunity to combine uh, the three countries in Northeast Asia to come up with the more uh, this valuable, valuable the dialogues that can expand it to uh, the other uh, countries of the region. Um, so John, I, I wondered whether I can draw you out a little bit more um, widely in, in terms of the impact of COVID-19 mm -hmm on South Korean debates and thinking about uh, other great power relationships 
so far. Um, ha has there been any implication for how South Koreans have been thinking about um, uh, the alliance relationship with the United States, for example? The alliance, I would say this, overall, the soft power of America, I think, in my opinion, has been declined. Um, the, after all, this USA, the richest and then technologically most advanced countries, uh, has hit hard the worst uh, by the COVID-19. So the world is puzzled. How come USA is, is doing so badly? Now they have a political unrest following the, uh, the killing of uh, George Floyd. So uh, we, um, the Asians are looking at whether um, the especially Trump administration can have uh, the credible leadership uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, however, however, um, in terms of the, the alliance, uh, the attitude toward the USA, I think South Koreans have uh, embraced very strong support for aligning with the USA. Um, and I think that that attitude has been very much strengthened after the, um, the Chinese economic retaliation over the introduction of uh, the missile defensive mechanism called THAAD to, to South Korea. So uh, that aspect, yes, we worried about all this transactional approach by uh, President Trump pushing South Korea to pay more in hosting American troops in South Korea. And we were concerned about uh, the President Trump is uh, trying to do, uh, bringing 9,500 American soldiers stationed in Germany. So we, we worry about this kind of uh, uh, move. However, um, so to up to now, um, uh, you know, the, the America has shown their commitment, for example, to the security of the South China Sea by showing all this, you know, force. I think it was last week. So, so in that, that kind of signal is important to, to allies in the Asia Pacific region. So yes, uh, we see some declines of the power uh, in terms of these health issues and democracy issues. But as for the, the security commitment from the USA to the region, uh, uh, we are still optimistic. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sutong. Maybe we can stay with this um, issue of US-China strategic competition, which you know, has been exacerbated and made even more uncertain in many ways by COVID-19. And, and here I'd like to bring uh, Runway back in again and also give Druva a chance to, to comment on, on this particular issue. Let, let's try Runway's line again. I think China-US relation is going down uh, since last year, the trade war between two major countries. Uh, and this year, with the pandemic, the situation is worsening, worsening than last year. So it's still going down. Uh, we haven't got a real turning point to, to be a more positive uh, side uh, in the next uh, half year. And uh, now U.S. is facing two or uh, four kind of crises, the pandemic, the violence of uh, racial uh, uh, contradictions and uh, economic recession and then political uh, uh, presidential election. So all kind of crisis put together and how White House to deal with, to deal with these four uh, real crises, uh, one of their uh, way to go out is uh, books on China. Uh, the, media, the public opinion, and the White House together uh, blame China as the responsibility of the crisis in the US and in the world. So uh, recently we read the new released uh, official report and the May 20th, uh, the White House in the strategic uh, document on People's Republic of China. And even the, this official document much worse than the National Security Strategy Report in 2017. 
But I don't believe new Cold War is happening between two major countries because it's very cost. It's cost too much for U.S. to to the south, and also it can not really mobilize all the airlines countries to go along with this new Cold War against China, and also economically, uh, no one can uh, pay this cost if to stop all the links between China and the U.S. economically, and uh, also the Chinese American in U.S. now is suffering from this kind of discrimination. So I think this is the last part of Trump's policy toward ch against China. And uh, ch for China, now we are uh, focusing on ourselves to improve our inside uh, economic and uh, social uh, issues and uh, try to open wider to outside. So recently, the financial uh, market is opening uh, almost completely to foreign capital and the U.S. Uh, financial institutions are moving very fast into China market. Also manufacturing, uh, many capital from U.S. is moving into China. So there are two trends. One is uh, toward the new Cold War, the other is toward the uh, closer economic uh, integration. So I don't know which one is the mainstream. Uh, we, we wait, wait and see uh, if uh, Trump's policy can work, uh, they will keep on. If it doesn't work, they will maybe change it. This is a really interesting point, uh, Renwei, that, you know, and, and Asia is often like this, isn't it? We often have, you know, dualistic, you know, things that should not be happening at the same time happening together. So on the one hand, that intensifying economic interdependence still between China and, and the United States. On the other hand, the, the, the uh, descent into something like a new, new Cold War. And these two things are happening at the same time. And I want to bring Druva in and then come back to you, Renway. Um, you know, Druva, for, for the rest of us in Asia, of course, you know, that kind of uncertain dualistic dynamic between the US and China just makes life a lot harder, right? Uh, you've written recently that intensifying competition uh, between the US and China means increasingly tough choices for, for the rest of Asia. Um, there is also the, the popular idea in India for a long time now that a multipolar world is, is a better one for India. You know, um, where, where do you think the current dynamics leave the prospects for that kind of a multipolar Asia, at least? Well, you know, I think the question is first, um, to what degree, as, as uh, Professor said correctly, uh, what degree will there be a U.S.-China, intensified U.S.-China competition? Um, and, you know, I, I would say my sense is actually there's a growing bipartisan consensus in the U.S., uh, not just amongst Trump supporters and, and, and the Trump administration, but actually increasingly also Democrats, uh, both in, in the U.S. Congress, but also uh, Joe Biden and, and his campaign, uh, to take on a more competitive uh, approach to China. And so I suspect we won't go back to a, a, an era where there was a more cozy interdependence between the U.S. and China. There will be much harder uh, lines drawn in, in, in this respect. I think that that's becoming increasingly clear. Um, I'm also not so sure that uh, the U.S., uh, you know, barring a certain, you know, the investor community and, and so forth, that they will be the kinds of costs, uh, you know, uh, the, the, that the cost benefit calculation will necessarily adhere to, uh, to, to what many expect uh, in the sense that I think there is a growing consensus that on many areas, uh, the U.S. has been uh, an, a relative loser from this engagement that it has uh, uh, th that is engaged in with, with China over the last 30, or 30 years or so. So, um, you know, the, the, the long term is I think we will see a great disruption to supply chain. We're already seeing this discussion underway uh, when it comes to 5G telecommunications. But just uh, today, uh, actually in the last 24 hours, we saw an announcement, for example, of the creation of a new body uh, for artificial intelligence, a new uh, partnership body. And that includes uh, the Five Eye countries, uh, the European Union and several EU member states, but also Japan, Korea, India, uh, and Singapore, and noticeably uh, China is not, not participating in that. One of the COVID contact groups that's being led at the vice ministerial level on the US side uh, involves the US, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Vietnam. So again, so, so we're seeing, and all, all of this is to suggest that we're seeing a kind of uh, a, a greater fractured 
a more fractured relation uh, dynamic uh, in Asia. Uh, and, uh, and, and in some ways, you know, one of the things why we may see more of uh, intensified supply chains within, uh, no, within Northeast Asia, within East Asia, um, the fact is, though, there will be a huge demand for market access that will continue. And those two, the two other very big markets beyond mainland China will remain the United States and the European Union. So uh, again, I, 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 I do think we need to question some of our, the assumptions that uh, we've gotten very used to over the last 20 years or so, and whether these are really sustainable relationships going forward. Absolutely. And you know, your, your point about the continued importance of the European Union as a market, of course, is, um, is something that I'm, I, I think the, the um, Chinese um, policymakers have, have been well aware of. And, and maybe this is the point of bringing runway back into the conversation and to think about one of the remaining sort of you know um, obvious areas of focus in the economic recovery ahead for china uh, the belt and road initiative which after all is a way for china to to you know um, deepen and leverage the, the the european market ultimately as well um, uh, Renway, uh, you know, um, how, how do you see COVID-19 as having affected the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative? And can we expect to see some alterations and changes in the way BRI projects and initiatives are carried out um, from now on? Yeah, I recently published an article on Global Times in China on this uh, impact of pandemic on Belt and Road. Um, Obviously, there are several negative impacts, that is, uh, many projects in, on Baton Rouge uh, have been stopped uh, since many Chinese engineers and their laborers cannot move to outside from China to these countries. And also, uh, second, many uh, local government of uh, the uh, host uh, countries uh, believe it's too heavy the burden of debt from federal projects. So some of them put federal as part of the uh, debt problem of pandemic. So uh, there is a debt crisis uh, on federal too. And also US and some other airlines countries believe it's more geopolitical uh, uh, issue than uh, global of uh, markets. So these are more negative parts. And also we can see some uh, bright or positive uh, signals from Bandero. One is it is the only one part of world market that is still keep, still keeps uh, keep on growing uh, early part of this year. The uh, trade volume is uh, five percent larger than uh, last year so it's very positive positive. and the second is uh, china is uh, uh, we, we adjust our projects in uh, along the belt and the road and uh, and uh, more more efficient more uh, less risky uh, projects will be put on the focus and uh, some projects will be delayed or, or stopped or suspended and also we put to, uh, public health as new items uh, of Baton Rouge. So uh, last uh, several years, we didn't put this uh, on very important position. And, uh, and the industrial parks along the Baton Rouge, uh, we think is more healthy than the uh, infrastructure uh, projects. So uh, China Enterprises is going to uh, working harder uh, to bring work harder uh, in the industrial parts. However, uh, uh, maybe the speed of federal will slower, the, uh, the scale will be uh, shorter, will be smaller uh, than before, but it will be more efficient and more uh, uh, safety. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I'll stop here. Um, uh, on, on this related issue, you know, obviously many countries in Asia are thinking already beyond the, 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 the immediate crisis of the pandemic and thinking about recovery. Um, one of the major issues for the region as a whole, of course, um, is this question of um, 
prospects for China's economic recovery um, in, in the coming months and years, and also issues about how China plans to cope with weak domestic and global demand as uh, a, a global production center. So would you be able to give us some key yeah. highlights on, on those points, please? Thank you very much for this very important question. And uh, I think China, Japan, South Korea, and ASEAN is going to uh, complete our uh, FTA, uh, free trade agreement, uh, by uh, the form of 10 plus 3. And uh, this will uh, change the integration, will we be much closer. And also, uh, last year, by the end of last year, ASEAN is number one trade partner of China now, uh, surpass the uh, European Union and the US. So ASEAN, you see ASEAN is about 400 million population. Uh, uh, EU is 400 million population. US is 400 pop million population, the same population. But ASEAN is much lower per capita than US and EU. But its trade volume with China is number one. What does it mean? So you can see. And uh, um, also, uh, I think uh, China is, uh, China, the Belton Road is the number one party is in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in uh, Thailand, in Myanmar, in Indonesia, uh, 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 to, um, Jakarta to Bandung uh, Highway uh, Railroad, uh, High Speed Railroad. Then like this. And uh, also we, we think we should be very careful. Uh, don't make uh, too heavy burden um, to the uh, countries of ASEAN members. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dhruva, turning to you with a same, similar set of questions, right? Uh, again, India's economic importance for, for the rest of Asia um, uh, is growing. Um, what do you see the prospects um, for Indian recovery, Indian economic recovery uh, from, from the COVID crisis? And particularly, how do you see that debate about self-sufficiency playing out um, in India? Right, so, so you know, I think the two, two things. One is that uh, I think we will see a very sharp uh, 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 drop in the Indian economy in the, in, in the coming um, year or so. Uh, and the question will really be how, how fast a recovery it faces after that. Uh, into negative territory, possibly for the first time since the 1990s. So this will be quite a significant shock for, for the Indian system. It already is. India uh, put an unprecedented nation, nationwide lockdown uh, in, in two phases. They're now in the process of partially lifting that uh, phase. Um, so I, I think there, there's no question that the consequences will be very severe. Uh, and particularly for a low-income country such as India, this, is, uh, this has very important human consequences as well, uh, which can't be uh, overlooked. Um, now, what does that mean in the in the longer term? I mean, I, I think there'll always be certain opportunities. You know, in some ways, this is an opportunity for India to put in place a, an industrial uh, policy, uh, which is it had not been able to do uh, in, in in the past, at least not on a nationwide scale, state uh, scale. So, uh, so I think that this is what we we, we will probably uh, see happening in the near future. The one question, you know, there has been a, a renewed focus on on sort of economic nationalism. Um, but I don't think that that is as um, a different or, or, or as contradictory to uh, globalization as many people uh, uh, see. You know, India has the third largest trade deficit, or, I'm sorry, third largest current account deficit of any country after the US and UK. And so it's seen as, you know, uh, globalization as being something that has benefited other countries relatively more than it has uh, the Indian economy. Uh, except in certain areas. So I think we will see uh, a, a sort of an, an attempt to rebalance that. Uh, already we've seen the trade deficit shrink to its lowest in, you know, since 1994 or so. Uh, what, again, how the, the nature of Indian industrial recovery after this will, will really be uh, what's in question. Thank you very much, Dhruva. Um, I'm afraid um, that we are out of time, comprehensively out of time on, on this panel. Um, thank you very much um, to, to all of our panelists um, for a very wide ranging and also quite in-depth uh, discussion of the varied trends and patterns of uh, COVID-19's impacts on Asia.